Good morning, and welcome to St Catherine's, Aiton upon the Weald Moors. My name is Neil Robinson, reader with permission to officiate in the parish of All Saints Wellington with St Catherine's, Aiton. The service and responses will be taken from the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer, and has been pre-recorded at my home in Ketley. The hymns this morning are played, sung and recorded by our son, the Reverend Paul Robinson, and I'm grateful to my wife Judith for reading from the Bible. If you're new to this congregation, I offer you a very special welcome, and should you wish to follow up anything that is said or just get to know us better, please contact our vicar, the Reverend Tim Carter, and the details are on the All Saints website. Thank you for joining us electronically for this service of morning prayer. It is good to join together in worship, however remote that may seem at present. Notices are available on the All Saints website or by email. Please do keep in touch with things happening online. Prayers are always welcome for the activities taking place. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us. These are some words from Daniel, a prophet like Ezekiel in exile. They cause us to repent. So we call ourselves to confession. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same, by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most holy and worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus you our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. God of the new day and God of love, you created us and you have redeemed us. As you scatter the mist from the hills, Banish the deeds of darkness from the sons and daughters of your light. Help us to know and believe that, as the children of your love, we are free to begin again, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. We say together the Venite Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We hear words from the Old Testament and New Testament read to us by Judith. Ezekiel chapter 20 verses 1 to 8. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day, some of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord, and they sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Have you come to inquire of me? As surely as I live, I will not let you inquire of me, declares the Sovereign Lord. Will you judge them? Will you judge them, Son of man? Then confront them with the detestable practices of their ancestors and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I chose Israel, I swore with uplifted hand to the descendants of Jacob and revealed myself to them in Egypt. With uplifted hand I said to them, I am the Lord your God. On that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. And I said to them, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in Egypt. And now from Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. 
I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I have I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that my, by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day, some of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 1. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. This morning we're going to be talking about leadership and management. Both our readings begin with the elders presenting themselves and there is a more sinister undercurrent in the Acts reading regarding some form of judgment in Jerusalem. So we have elders of the nation in Ezekiel, elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts, and elders of the emerging Christian faith in Jerusalem. So let's look at the context surrounding these three episodes. First to Ezekiel, where the response to the elders of the nation seems pretty scathing. Ezekiel was the son of a priest, but was taken into captivity in Babylon in the first wave with the king, Jehoiachin, as part of the policy of removing educated key people from those remaining in Jerusalem. Without going into detail, the time before the captivity was a depressingly faithless descent, and God felt it necessary to, as it were, cleanse the nation. Ezekiel is anxious to preserve the spiritual and cultural identity of the people in exile, looking towards a time when Israel might return as a faithful sovereign people to their own lands, which we know did happen. 
The elders appear to be day-to-day people without thought or understanding of what has brought them to this low point of the nation's history, going back to idolatrous practices in Egypt. This continued during the Exodus, despite God's fulfilled promises of freeing them from slavery and bringing them into the promised land. Even with all that to reflect on, the faithlessness often continued, and prophet after prophet, as we read in book after book of the Old Testament, warns the readers and spiritual leaders of God's displeasure and the impending disaster. We'll come back to Ezekiel to draw issues from our readings together, but for now we move to Ephesus. Paul had spent about three years at Ephesus working hard to establish a Christian church community there. Ephesus was a bit of a had-been place, with the once busy harbour having silted up and was now some distance from the port at Miletus. The claim to fame of Ephesus was the idol worship at the temple of Artemis and the local craftsman's profit from the sale of idol artefacts. This had led to a riot when Paul denounced idols and he was forced to leave. He returned briefly to the nearby port of Miletus. So here we have a Christian community strong enough to confront the idolatry threat as long as Paul was with them, but facing pressure from the traditional Jewish community as well as from the commercial interests of those benefiting from idolatry. The elders here were largely faithful, but needed regularly to check that their focus was on salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, at this point, was journeying towards Jerusalem, and both they and he are concerned about meeting the elders in Jerusalem. There had always been a tension between those who saw the Christian faith as stemming from and requiring legal acceptance of the laws of Judaism and the Gentile converts. This had led to the compromise of the Jerusalem Council some three or four years before Paul ministered in Ephesus, where circumcision was not mentioned in the press release, but the Gentile Christians were to abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. But despite this, many of the Jews were demanding that Gentile converts must be circumcised according to Abrahamic law before they could become Christians, and Paul would have none of this. He was on his way to Jerusalem to ensure the validity of the by faith alone stance he had taken with his Gentile congregations. So, as I said, we're going to look at leadership and management this morning. I can just see the training seminar where you're asked to split into groups and examine the skill necessary to resolve each of these scenarios with a plenary session at the end to see the common elements of the solution. I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that we're not going to do that, and not just because it would be impossible in our current situation, but I do want to draw on some leadership skills and experience with faith relevance to highlight the needs apparent from our readings, which we can learn from in our sophisticated profiling for management positions today. We turn to look at the elders in Ezekiel and wonder why God is rejecting even the idea of their inquiry. We don't even know what it was about. Three not unreasonable leadership skills. Analysis, accountability, and commitment to the project. I'd want to see evidence of all of these in somebody I was giving responsibility to. What was the data available to these elders? They knew 
of all the failings from the time of the Egyptian slavery, the idolatry before, during, and after the Exodus. They'd been warned about their faithlessness, corrupt practice, and moral decline. They were elders of Israel, guardians of the faith, the culture of the nation, and as we know, the salvation of the world. And they had failed on every front and in every serious leadership situation. There has to come a time, despite every effort being made, when enough is enough. There had to be accountability then, as in the future. God was calling time on their eldership, even though they themselves were not beyond saving. The essential requirement was repentance and a recognition of their failure, both personally and through their guidance of the nation. Up until now, they had accepted God's unearned protection, but failed to take on board their side of the covenant promise, which committed them to the project of salvation. They had accepted protection, but gave no service to the Lord. So analysis, accountability, and commitment had to be matched by repentance, faith, and service. The elders at Ephesus, whilst by no means to be criticized as much, were nevertheless given warnings about coming threats. As a manager, I would always try to spot threats to a project and seek to design them out before they reached a critical point. At Ephesus, the elders had been effective with Paul being present. Now he tells them to continue their pastoral care of the congregation, to keep watch, be good shepherds, and continue the hard work to help the weak. Paul also tells them to guard against subversion, speaking of the plots of my Jewish opponents, and after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. And even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So there's the direct challenge from idol worshippers, the Jewish opponents, and perhaps the more subtle distortion from within. I thought you meant, and I understood it meant, when the instruction, training, or advice was very clear. Paul stresses that he has lived among them at no cost to the community. You know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. So Paul has worked for no personal gain, and the reputation gained is not for him, but for the glory of God. So the elders at Ephesus are to continue the pastoral care of the team, to guard against subversion and accept no personal gain. And what equips them for the task? They are to love their Lord and those he has brought to them, ascribing worth and dignity in their worship and relationships. They are to call on the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for protection, insight and inspiration. And they are to work in selfless humility in the service of their Lord. Turning to Paul's desire to get to Jerusalem, Anxious as he was, yet compelled by the Holy Spirit, it is evident that the vision, the nature and order of Christianity was at stake. The lingering thoughts of Christianity being a sect of Judaism had to be put aside to allow Jesus, his death, resurrection and salvation by faith through the grace of God to be the central basis of belief. The compromise of the Jerusalem Council was no longer enough, and if this meant confrontation for the gospel, so be it. 
Paul was right to be concerned, as were the believers in Ephesus, about not seeing his face again. Because this journey to Jerusalem, a confrontation in the same place as Jesus 50 years earlier, was to end in being passed to civil authorities and his choice as a Roman citizen to be tried in Rome. Paul was choosing, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to call out the threat to salvation, to give his all for the project in service and submission to the will of God. As we consider how the modern day church is managed and led, albeit in these strange times, established, although not yet established, but constantly empowered and re-enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. What lessons do we see in the three examples of eldership revealed this morning? We've seen many traits of good leadership ignored, recommended, or made supreme, such as analysis, accountability, commitment to the project, active responsibility, pastoral care, identifying threats, no personal gain, vision, clarity of direction, and that compromise can undermine. In every case, we have appropriate Christian responses, such as repentance, faith, service, godly reverence, love, the power of the Holy Spirit, selfless humility, calling out the threats to salvation and confronting evil. And most important of all is to place Jesus, the cross, and faith as the only means to salvation. As Christians, we must consider ourselves to be both leaders and followers. Mission in broad terms is about leading people to Christ, and faith development is about being led into deeper understanding and relationship with the Lord. The Spirit prepares and empowers us in both respects. On the one hand, we prayerfully approach those who the Spirit leads us to, and on the other, we must allow ourselves to be developed into the instruments of God's purpose. Surely that involves all that range of skills with which we are already graciously equipped, being used in the service of our Lord. I'm going to leave this now with three questions. Where is your life being led and by whom? Second, what have you got to give and how can that be effectively used? And third, whose selfless sacrifice is worthy to receive all the glory. Amen.
that way is light all other pathways end in night walk now with him that way is rest all other pathways are unblessed With Jesus, change the view. He will make all things sweet and new. Will bring you fragrance from each flower and hallow every passing hour. join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and merciful hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. The Chosen Collect for the Fourteenth Sunday after Trinity Almighty God, you call your Church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may turn to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. The Second Collect for Peace O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, 
may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me, if you will, in the third collect, for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who hast safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we are aware of many issues in your world today. Issues of human deprivation, conflict, and medical need. But you know of all the situations that we don't. By your wisdom, understanding, and love, and your almighty, all-powerful hand, lead your people into a world at peace with itself and with you. We pause to bring those situations known to us to your gracious throne. Loving Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Our hymn, as we come towards the close of our service, continues the theme of leadership. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. Heavenly Father, lead us o'er the world's tempestuous sea. Guard us, guide us, keep us, feed us, for we have no help but Thee. Yet possessing every blessing, if our God, our Father, be. Saviour, breathe forgiveness o'er us, all our weakness thou dost know. Thou didst tread these earth before us, thou didst feel its keenest woe. Lone and dreary, faint and weary, through the desert thou didst go. Coming to the close of our time together online, but if the service has raised questions for you and you'd like either to talk with someone or have them pray with you, please do make contact through All Saints website. Next Sunday, the morning worship service for St. Catherine's will be conducted by our own vicar, the Reverend Tim Carter. 
Thank you once again for joining our service this morning. And now a blessing. Live in union with Christ Jesus as Lord. Be rooted in him. Be built in him. Grow strong in the faith. Let your hearts overflow with thankfulness. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all, those who we love, and those we are called to love, now and forever. Amen.